Hello and welcome to this SAS companion. This one is for lecture 14, which covers analysis of covariance, otherwise known as ANCOVA. And we're actually going to go through example 11.3 in the book, um, which means we're going to have to import the data from 11.6, table 11.6. Luckily, I did that beforehand. Let's go ahead and make things bigger. And I believe tools. And I believe options. Right, we could start. So the first step is always to put the data in. So we'll call this data. Um, how have I been doing it? DT116. And there's going to be three variables put into this, and that's class will be the categorical variable, and then the pretest, and then the post-test. And the reason we're choosing those three is because that's what the example says. And then we input the data lines, and now the data. So the first data value is going to be the class, the second will be the pretest score, the third will be, wow, I got those in there really fast. My typing skills have improved dramatically. So there it is, just got it in, took a long time to do it, but page 593, there's the data. Notice that this is not balanced, because the number in class 1 is not the same as in the number in class 2. Should get some idea, and actually don't need that, we'll go with a proc univariate. I'm going to run and quit. Now I'll show you the sample statistics so you can double check that you got the numbers in there right. Can I make that bigger? By golly, I can. So the sample size is 56. There's the mean. This is the overall mean for the class variable. That should also suggest to us that it's not balanced data. Scrolling down in the mean median mode. Scrolling to the pre, there's the mean for the pre, the variance for the pre, that's the pretest score, and then for the post-test, that's what we're going to try to model, that'll be our dependent variable post-test. Now notice that the class variable is categorical, but the pre-variable is numeric, and this will be the first time in this course, and almost the last time in this course, where we will deal with a uh, a numeric independent variable. And the nice thing is this also serves as the um, bridge between the analysis of variance stuff that we've done in this course and the linear regression stuff that you could and should do in future courses. I strongly suggest that if you haven't taken a linear regression course yet, you take it. And then you start to think, wow, there is really no difference between this analysis of variance analysis and the linear regression analysis. And you're right, because underneath what this SAS program is doing is just multiplying various matrices. And it doesn't matter if the various matrices are have categorical variables for the independent or numeric variables for the independent. In fact, if you're doing linear regression in SAS, the proc that you're going to use is going to be proc GLM. Yeah, not really. Not anymore. So let's do ANCOVA. And the proc is going to be proc GLM. There are others, but this is good basic start for analysis of covariance in SAS. Was it 11.6? Let me scroll up, just double check, 11.6. And then we're going to need a class statement. Well, what is the categorical variable here? It's not confusingly, it's just class. And there's three values, three levels to class, class 1, class 2, class 3. And then what always follows is the model statement. It's going to be the 
dependent variable, the variable that we're trying to model, the variable that we're trying to understand better. Post, and that's going to be pre class. And normally, I would include an interaction term here. Um, but the book doesn't. The book is assuming that the effect of pre on post is the same for all the classes. The effect of pre, the pre-test score, on the post-test score, the effect is going to be the same for all three classes. That's what the book is saying here without adding an interaction term. If you believe that the effect is going to be different, that is, the slope is going to be different depending on the class, then you would have to add an interaction term. But the book says, nope, slopes are going to be the same. Do I have a run and a quit? i got a run and a quit. So let's run this and see what we get. Class is defined as a class variable, categorical, three levels. Uh, levels are 1, 2, and 3. There's 56 values that were read in, 56 records. And here's the model, uh, the ANOVA table for the entire model. And let's just see where we're headed. Let's go into our book, page 594, table 11.7. The analysis of variance table, the first one we get in SAS, is going to be the top of table 11.7. I do need to say, when you're working with one-way, two-way, fixed effects, analysis, variance, there is an ANOVA table that everybody understands, and all you have to do is give the ANOVA table, and it's like, hey, I know what this is. Once you get beyond that, it's very difficult to create a single table that provides all the information. And there is no one table that is common throughout. So the trick is just to try to create a table that is readable that contains all the information. And the book gives a really good one. It's not the only one, but it's a really good one. So let's double check that all the numbers are there. The model, three degrees of freedom, sums of squares, mean square, yep, let's check out the F value. The F value for this is again going to be the model mean squares divided by the error mean squares. And the P value, since P value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. In this case, the null hypothesis is that the model tells us nothing, the null, the nothing, the model tells us nothing about the dependent variable. Well, that's not true. p-value is less than that, so we reject that. We have the r-squared value, coefficient of variation, the root mean squared, which is just the square root of the mean squared error, and the average for the dependent variable. We got the two ANOVA tables. One gives the type 1 sums of squares. The other one gives the type 3 sums of squares. And up until today, these two ANOVA tables have always given the same values. That's not the case anymore. I've always read off of the type 3 sums of squares, and you should do that as well. Here's, what, here's the difference between the type 1 and the type 3 sums of squares. For the type 1 sums of squares, this 380 is just the sums of squares described by the pre variable. And the 228 is the sums of squares des described by the class variable given those already described by the pre. So order does matter with the type 1 sums of squares. In fact, I'm going to create another PROC GLM. And instead of doing it pre then class, I'm going to do class then pre. And let's see, let's go ahead and clear that. Let's see that there is a difference in those type 1 sums of squares. Let's go ahead and see what's going on here. Ah, that's better. So here's the type 1 sums of squares. When pre comes first, it's 380, 228. And here's the type 1 sums of squares when class comes first, 115, 493. And the reason it's different is the type 1 sums of squares are sequential. It's what are the sums of squares for pre given everything that's come before it. 
Now with class, it's the sums of squares for class given everything that comes before it, which is nothing. The type 3 are not sequential. The type 3 sums of squares are going to be the same between the two orderings. And the way to read this is this is the sums of squares for class given all the other variables in the model. And this is the sums of squares for pre given all the other variables in the model. Not the variables that have already come, but all of the other variables. So the type 3 sums of squares are always the ones that we want to look at. And if you notice, the type 3 sums of squares for this ordering of class then pre is the same as the sums of, uh, type 3 sums of squares when it's pre then class. And these f values come where the denominator is the mean squared error and the associated p values. Notice the f values and the p values also differ for the type 1 sums of squares but not for the type 3. Double check that. If we use type 1 sums of squares, we're going to say the class does not have an effect because the p-value is greater than alpha. But using the type 3 sums of squares, class does have an effect. And that's the big reason why we should use type 3 sums of squares. We want to make the statement that class does or does not have an effect. But type 1, we can only say class does not have an effect given nothing else. Unless class is entered second, then we would say class does have an effect given other things. Order matters with type 1s, which is why they're problematic. Always rely on type 3s. So. We've now got the second part of table 11.7. We've got a cool graphic, too. We'll talk about that later. We need the third part, the parameter estimates. Well, in order to get the parameter estimates, or the estimate of the slopes, we have to go back here. And I'm going to delete that second one because a lot of typing. We use the option solution. I believe we've seen this option before option solution on the model statement. And when we get the model uh, solution on the model statement, we get this table. And we can ignore everything on here except for pre. Because pre is the only variable that really does have a slope effect that we care about. The other reason we should ignore everything but the pre is because the design matrix is singular which means that there's very little confidence that these estimates with B's next to them are correct. So the pre-estimate is 0.773, and that's the slope of each of these lines. And again, these lines have the same slope because we assumed this was an additive model. And we entered this as an additive model. There is no interaction here. If we had an interaction, the slopes would be different, or slopes would be allowed to be different. So the estimate of 0.77 says for every one increase in the pretest score, the post-test score will increase on average 0.77. There's the standard error, 0 0.1705. T-value is the ratio of the estimate to the standard error. There's the p-value for the test that the estimate is 0. Because the p-value is less than alpha, we reject the null hypothesis that the pre-test has no effect on the post-test scores. And there's a graphic of the data. The data are the dots. The lines are the model. OK, so that takes care of three of those four parts on table 11.7. We need to get the least squares means. It's going to take another line. The command is ls means. You have to specify the categorical variable. And if we look at table 11.7, it gives us the class, the, the least squares means, and the standard error. By default, SAS will not give the standard error, but we can ask it to give us the standard error. 
using the option STDERR. So now we hit run. And again, we got the GLM stuff, the model ANOVA table. We ignore the type 1 sums of squares. We got the type 3 sums of squares. We got the pre, the slope for the pre variable. We got a graphic of the data and the model. And this is the new stuff. We got the LS mean given for each of the three classes. We've got the standard error. And that p-value is for the test that the LS mean is equal to 0. So we can conclude that LS means none of those, least, the, none of those means are equal to 0. Double check that our numbers match. They do. And we have just created table 11.7. We've talked through it. We've learned about the parts. So at the very end of this, we're going to conclude that there is a significant effect of the pretest score on the post-test score. On average, for every one increase in the pretest score, the post-test score will go up by 0.77. I think that's all we got. The model does tell us something about the data. I mean, I'm sorry, the model does tell us something about the post-test score. Oh, we do know this. The uh, le uh, the uh, intercepts, we can think of these least squares means as intercepts or as distances between these lines. Well, we can't think of them as, as distances, but as intercepts. So the least squares means, and we could actually perform some t-tests as whether or not these are different. But I will save that for another course when we can go beyond just describing the data and draw some conclusions about whether or not class 1 and class 3 are significantly different. And that's it. So the key again is PROC GLM. What have we added new? Not much. We've still got the class statement. We've still got the model statement. We did learn that order does not matter for type 3 sums of squares. If we want to get the actual slope, we have to include the option solution. We've got the least squares means statement again. And we need to add the options STDERR for standard error. And that's it. Hopefully this was helpful. Take care of yourselves.